and Innovation Institute has the honor of hosting the annual Chef Lecture on Social Entrepreneurship, which was established in 2019 through an, endow an endowment by Dr. Jag Chef and his wife, Madhu Chef. As a result of the chef's generosity, each year we have the opportunity to invite a distinguished social innovator or entrepreneur to deliver a speech and create a forum for sharing ideas and practices of social entrepreneurship and innovation. First of all, the poverty has been rising in America with the decline of the middle class starting in the mid 80s. The poverty definition grown to about 15% right now, and it is estimated in about less than five years, it will reach a peak of about 20%. Despite all the government interventions, social welfare programs, the poverty level is not decreasing, but is increasing. At the same time, the affluent segment in the society has been growing even faster. What used to be only about 10, 15% of the people above upper middle class, as it is called in the typical definition, is now growing all the way to 40%. Not only the disparity is growing, but the bulge is on the two extreme sides and it is not sustainable for a bunch of reasons, from political reasons, unrest reasons, no matter how you look at it, so everybody's concerned about this thing. So let's analyze why it happened. One of the key causes has been the outsourcing of the manufacturing sector from America in the 80s. It went worldwide. It was in the process, the typical protection that middle class get got at that time, which was union labors, unions protection in terms of firing, hiring, et cetera, went away, which has led to really decline in the middle class in fact, I can give you one story that if you are a mother, high school educated with children, and if you get divorced, you are instantly in the poverty category. There's nothing you can do. Minimum wage is not sustainable. That's clearly one major factor. That as we have gone more and more towards services economy, and at the same time, services economy has grown enormously because today you have to have dual income in a family just to survive in a large metro area or to have your aspirations meet economically, which leads to outsourcing of a lot of homemaking activities like cooking, cleaning, and childcare. For example, today in the US, out of three meals a day per capita, one and a half meals we are eating out. Breakfast is gone now. Lunch, of course, is eaten out by kids in the school or working parents wherever they are working. And only one meal which we really eat at home is the dinner. And even there, 50% of the meal served at home is prepared by somebody else and delivered to you to do the final pressure. In the services economy, at the lower end of the services economy, such as the rise of the quick service restaurants, for example, McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, Burger King, whatever we talk about, the wages are just not there. We still have a strong opposition in the society to raise those minimum wages to a level which is affordable. And most of those locations are in the metro areas where the cost of living is very high. So now you have a family that is in double jeopardy. And unfortunately, there is no political process that is likely to solve the problems, either from a welfare viewpoint, providing food assistance, et cetera, and if you look at the impact of the pandemic, it is even worse right now where people even in the middle class are going for food lines. That's unthinkable in the richest country of the world. There is additional 20% of the people, the 20% poor below the poverty level, additional 20% of the people are what I call working poor or invisible poor. These are the people who are not able to have a cash flow monthly despite earning two wages in the family because they're in metro areas where the cost of rent alone is very high. So if you think about cities like San Francisco, cities like New York, for example, or anything in New Jersey for that matter, any large metro area, the cost of living is just too high. But this is the reality of America. This was not the dream of America once we went into the industrialization under Abraham Lincoln. It was continuing very, very well, but it has declined since the first oil energy crisis. 
My second point is that the entrepreneurship is a way out as articulated by Muhammad Yunus and, and the Grameen Bank. And the reason is that surprisingly, poverty and entrepreneurship are symbiotic. In fact, entrepreneurship is what I call for the poor, poor side of the society as entrepreneurship by necessity. We always associated entrepreneurship from the emotional excitement, positive thing, but people also have entrepreneurship by necessity, just like inventions by necessity. And we saw that, that out of sheer necessity, right now, find poverty or location, access to location, as we have been, people become more entrepreneurial. They began to innovate or improvise somehow. So entrepreneurship has a clear, clear symbiotic relationship, which is why this combination of focusing on the poor in the society, giving them the chance for entrepreneurship, not just through education, I think is a great, great model. And it is very scalable as it has been shown. This is the first time where you see that NGOs can do as good a job in serving the society as the governments can do. So it becomes very much like an economic social business model and can be scalable as we have seen the scalability in the US. Now think about it, something that begins as an innovation or an idea in Bangladesh, something that does very well in countries like India and other emerging markets is now coming here in many ways. I think many, many ways innovation is taking place out there and we need to adapt them for the American situation. And the sizes are enormous. Biggest problem, of course, with the poor people is access to capital or access to resources in any way, support systems, whatever they are. And therefore the Grameen model also is very good in terms of not only giving micro lending, but providing the support system. And as you can see, the results are fantastic. So many banks that have been opened up in metropolitan areas have done exceptionally well. The traditional banking sector does not know how to do business with unbanked population all over the world. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Garima Sharma, Director of Georgia State's Social Entrepreneurship Program and Assistant Professor in our Andrew Young School of Policy Studies to lead a discussion focused on community-based entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship with Mr. Mariat. Dr. Sharma. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm uh, jump right into the questions, and we'll start with uh, how did the idea of Gram Vikas come about, uh, Joe? So, yeah, Gram Vikas is working on grand challenges such as clean water, access to education, health in the villages in India. So, tell us about how did you con uh, conceive of Gram Vikas, and how did you identify which issues should the organization address? Yeah, Gram Vikas has, it has been told, Gram means village, Vikas means development. And we wanted to do something about village development or rural development. And that is how we chose this particular, these two words, Gram Vikas. The idea of Gram Vikas came because a few of us who came together to form this organization, we thought that whatever we do in India, unless we do something drastic and dramatic almost for, uh, with, uh, with regard to rural India, development or would not be available to most of the people as 85% of the people of India are from rural areas. So, so we said, okay, we have to work. If we want to be in any way meaningful in the rural areas, and we started this organization called Gram Vikas. Gram Vikas was started with me, as I said, to work to enthuse the young people who came forward to work in, in the job market. If working, if working in a rural area, in a, in a village, would, would be challenge enough for them. There would not be the money that would be available elsewhere, but 
it would be a real challenging proposition. And that is how we came to uh, form Gram Vikas. So the, thank you for sharing that. I think thank you for sharing with us going all the way back. I, I know it's been a couple of decades since you started this organization. It has done so much. And so, uh, you know, I was inspired by your work to think about this talk as what we call community-based entrepreneurship. So it's an it's a evolving concept in the develop, developed world, really. Um, so we would love to hear about Gram Vikas in that context, because you know, when we think about an entrepreneur, we usually think about as sort of an individual person who's heroic, usually a man who launches innovative enterprises. But when we think about community-based entrepreneurship here, the community is the entrepreneur. So the community identifies the problem, creates solutions, owns the assets, and, you know, really reaps the reward. And in my understanding, community-based entrepreneurship is really at the heart of Gram Vikas. So what I'm going to do do for the next few minutes, just work, you know, to, uh, discuss with you different aspects of Gram Vikas so we really understand this concept of community-based entrepreneurship. So tell us about the key activities, you know. So you've done this huge project about building and maintaining toilets in villages in India. So tell us about what were some of the key activities and how did the funds come about? We saw that the health of situation of people in rural areas was extremely precarious. And when we looked at the reason for it, we found that the people depended on the source of water that was there in the village for all their needs. They, whether it is bathing, drinking, washing of animals, washing of clothes, everything was done with this water. And as such, it became extremely polluted. We wanted to see if something can be done to clean this water or to have alternative water to be brought to the village so that they, people would have access to clean water. Uh, we realized that if people needed water and if you, there was not much choice as to the water that they could get then they, they would use any water. So, and we realized that the water that was there in the village was mostly polluted because of the open defecation that was going on in each of the villages. We said something has to be done about that. And so we sat with the villagers one after another and said, what can we do? Whatever system that we are thinking, we have to think in a sustainable way because nobody, including Gram Vikas, would be there in future to see that the system worked. It had to be the people themselves. So what did we do? We spoke to the villagers and came up with the idea that every village who would participate in this program would raise an endowment or a corpus of a thousand rupees per family. Thousand rupees is I mean, less than $20 but it is a huge, huge amount of money for each family to contribute. But we went ahead and we realized that unless whatever the people were doing it 
it almost it had to hurt them. It had to really meaning. It had to really mean a lot to them, so for it to work. So they put this corpus together. Then we taught, or we assisted the people to learn how to make bricks, collect sand, collect rubble that could be collected, which means it is not to be bought. They didn't have to buy it. So they bought, they brought in all this rubble, sand, uh, aggregates, and slowly, and with the help of the boys and girls who were by now masons, they built a toilet and attached to a toilet, a, bath, a separate bathing room, so that that was greatly the need of women. Women wanted a private place to, <clears throat> to bathe and to, and especially they wanted a private place during their periods. Yeah. <clears throat> so the toilet bathing room came up. Uh, and from a very safe water source, water was tested. Water was pumped up to, a, to an, an overhead water reservoir and water was distributed to every household within the village without a single exception. This particular meter measured the amount of water that each family was using and they paid as per the use. This was a concept which at that time when we wanted to implement, we were almost laughed at, but it did work and it is still working. Okay. That's fantastic. and. You know, I, I followed your work and I've seen some of those, you know, toilets that the villagers built. And, you know, I've seen the villagers say that some of these are cleaner <laughs> than their own houses, you know, which is great. And so I think a really a challenging aspect of uh, community doing some work together, doing this entrepreneurial project together is governance, right? So who monitors, uh, who implements the rules? How do you sustain? And like I said, Gram Vikas has been so successful in maintaining what has been built. So tell us a little bit more about governance when it comes to community doing something together. It is for, it is quite easy for an NGO to say that it will be our governance. That means the NGO's governance. But there have been far too many uh, too many instances of this falling apart. So we, the beginning, beginning itself said that the, it has to, whatever is set up, whatever is done, has to be done by the people and the entire thing has to be governed and administered by the people. So there was a committee in each of these villages, there is a committee of men and women, 50% each, who, who decide on all policy of the village regarding water and sanitation. And as they implement that, even other things, other things like say grazing, where can they graze, when they can graze. So things related to water sanitation are also, get also caught up in, in this governance system. So 50% of the people 
of the personnel who are members of this argument. That is a very sacred code which is being adhered to by the village. It is often, I mean, it's not that we have made such drastic uh, gender sensitive strides that the men will immediately agree that is the women let there be 50 percent women you know it's a that's a very hard fought battle for the women to gain that space so but when they get that space they won't also let it go. And more than anything else, water sanitation is mostly a women as it is practiced in India.